So welcome. This is the first class September of 2020 of the Garden Club of South Carolina. I'm Trish Bender, your president. And today we are going to be studying the Garden for Life philosophy. Garden for Life is our 2019 through 2021 theme. And it invites all gardeners to take the initiative to garden for life not against it by cultivating life at all levels of the landscape. Now for many of you, this will seem very familiar and it will seem a lot like organic gardening, permaculture, biointensive gardening, forest gardening, wildlife gardening, etc., etc., etc. And while many of these practices can be included in a Garden for Life plan. The Garden for Life philosophy is bigger than all of that because the Garden for Life seeks one secret ingredient more than anything else, and that is connection over perfection. For so many years, we have been sold a mindset that gardening has to be the pursuit of excellence, that we have to master and dominate and manipulate the world around us to our own satisfaction. And while knowledge and expertise are always valuable. We want to make sure that we are not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. If you look at the mission of the Garden Club of South Carolina, it does not say the pursuit of excellence in horticulture. What it says is that we seek to promote the love of gardening. And all through my practice as a flower show judge, as a master gardener, as an organic gardener, I have studied gardening, but I always felt like there was one secret ingredient missing. And that was that the more I learned to manipulate my environment, the less it surprised me the less connected I felt to it and the more responsible I felt over it. So when someone turned me on to the idea that we are not masters over our landscapes, that we are integral members of our landscape, my perspective shifted. And that's what I'd like to share with you today. That is the fundamental key to Garden for Life, connection versus perfection. So when we look at Garden for Life as a philosophy, we wanna seek harmony and balance. We wanna seek an environment that creates opportunities for enchantment, those secret surprises that only things that are outside of our control can give us. And we also want to seek inclusive attitudes. And when I say inclusive attitudes, I mean that we see ourselves as part and partner with our landscape and not just overlord. So the four in Garden for Life stands for focusing on relationships. If I were going to a relationship with another individual, I wouldn't come to the table and say, these are all of the things that I absolutely insist that you do for me. I wouldn't get very far. Instead, it would be so much more productive if I went to another person and said, here are all the things that I can offer, what can you offer, and how can we build a beautiful life together? That's how you build relationships. 
And in gardening for life, the fundamental key of relationships is noticing the interconnectedness of all of the elements. So we are looking at how the hydrosphere, how water affects and interacts with air and soil, how soil interacts with the organisms that vitalize the soil and recreate the soil. Those interconnectedness relationships are key to making sure that we are successful in a garden for life philosophy. So when I want you to put on your little garden for life rose colored glasses, what I'm asking you to do is to seek the following three things. Remember what it was like when you were a child going into nature and you felt that curiosity that didn't make you necessarily want to know everything, but it made you want to interact with everything. It made you want to smell it and taste it and touch it and feel it and be with it. And out of that curiosity became this appreciation that I call fascination, where you are interacting with nature in such a way that it enriches both you and the world around you. It's kind of like going into the woods when you do forest bathing and you just feel your whole body wanting to relax. That's the key to expressing curiosity, fascination, and wonder. So when you garden for life, what you're actually doing, what you are getting out of it, is that you are changing your approach to gardening in such a way that you are learning how to watch nature. You are learning how to learn from nature itself, not just from Google or your iPhone or all of the resources that we have available to us. There's a great podcast called On Being that I highly recommend. And in a recent um, TED Talk on this podcast, the owner of TED Talk said, you know, so often we seek to name things and assume that we know them because we can identify their name. But that is such a small part of who and what that thing is. So as gardeners, we often say, ah, oh, well, that's a Camellia japonica, and it needs this, and it needs that, and it needs that. But what are we actually learning from that plant? How are we engaging with it? How is it enriching our lives? So again, knowledge is very important, but learning how to interact with things so that you allow those things to teach you naturally is also of value. How to explore. You know, children know this naturally, and there's a great book about nature play that I highly recommend. You can get it on Amazon if you work with children. And it gives you opportunities of creating natural spaces for children to learn in a natural way. This is also the fundamental policy of Waldorf School, of many Montessori schools. And as adults, we sometimes forget how valuable it is to just explore something so that we don't necessarily have to master it, we can just simply be with it. Let it wash over us and let us enjoy being in that sacred space with creation. How to sit. Now for many of us, this is very difficult, but I always challenge my garden club and the garden clubs that I speak to that after this class, I invite you and challenge you to go out into your garden 
and what I call kappa squat. Sit down, sit down in the middle of your garden, sit down in the middle of your weeds, in the middle of a, an overbrushed area and just sit there. Don't think about all of the things that need weeding and pruning and fertilizing and tending to. There's always time for that. But instead, allow yourself to be in the space to engage with it and let it surprise you. Let something catch your eye in your periphery so that you can be surprised. It's not something that you have any control over. And when you relinquish control, that's when the magic happens. And that's when you can lose yourself. So by creating spaces systematically, collaboratively, that engage us and give us the opportunity to get lost, to be spiritually, mentally, emotionally transported to another space, a space where you're not thinking about all the to-do items. You're not evaluating how well you are doing as a gardener, but you are just connecting with nature. That's garden for life. And sometimes, if you're lucky, every now and then, you will have a secret, sacred moment. This is a moment that I had in my own garden where once a year, my garden surprises me with a Louisiana water thrush. Now, sure, I could be proud that I have created the habitat that welcomes this bird, but this bird chose our garden one week out of the year when it's migrating through and it gave me that glorious dance with its tail bobbing up and down. It's a very shy bird and I just happened to be in the right moment at the right time to be able to enjoy that dance. So how does this differ from traditional gardening? Well, the goals are different. They are not in conflict with one another. I'm not here to tell you that the way you're gardening right now is wrong. I still want you to learn as much as possible to perfect your skills, but don't stop there. Make sure that you are pursuing the enjoyment and the love of gardening and the connection with nature just as much as you are pursuing the knowledge of natural stewardship. So where traditional gardens are only going after beauty or function, Garden for Life gardens are seeking harmony and balance. Where you may have a more manicured look in a traditional garden as the general model, GFLs prefer a natural feel. So it can look neat, but if it doesn't enrich the feeling that you have when you walk through that space, then you still have work to do. Where traditional gardening has large grassy areas based on an archaic model of grass and monoculture is the goal, Garden for Life and modern gardens have minimal turf areas. And this serves many functions, which we'll talk about. But keep in mind that grass is a wonderful thing. It's very functional. But if it is not necessary, perhaps we can engage in just using it as the pathways through our natural space. Where traditional gardens feature a lot of hardscapes, Garden for Life gardens choose more permeable paths. 
This enables more carbon capture, more water capture, more, more soil life, and more garden life. So the more permeable the path, the more life it will foster. And where traditional gardening, the gardening that you learn in landscape schools and horticulture classes, seeks to train you which chemical is the best solution for your problem, Garden for Life seeks to question whether it's a problem at all or whether it's a matter of imbalance that can be achieved through integrative pest management or just changing the food web relationship in your yard. So here are the 10 simple steps that we are going to go through in your garden for life um, pathway. So as we seek this journey, this is the 10 step process that is on your worksheet. The first is, and if any of you want to stop and take a screenshot of this, you can do that. And then we'll go through it one by one. So what do I mean by seeing the big picture? I've written about this in the Scoop newsletter several months ago, but one of the best ways that I invite you to see the big picture is to see how you are part of an overall um, physiognomy and a natural space is to go to your county tax website. And on that website, there will be what they call a GIS, GIS. This gives you an aerial photo of your actual space. And you can zoom out or zoom in so that you can actually see a picture of your landscape and see how you and your landscape is part of a bigger ecosystem. So this big blue dot on the screen is our current location where I live. And you can see I live near water, but not on water. But if you notice throughout this screen, there are tons and tons and tons of trees, as well as open air green spaces. I am part of an oak forest. But when most people ask, where do you live? Our current answer as social beings is, oh, I live in this town, off this highway, in this subdivision. And that's all well and good if I want to get to your place. But as a gardener and as a naturalist, if someone asks me where I live, I can say, I live in a temperate oak forest next to water. And that makes a big difference in how I approach my gardening um, journey because I want to be part of something. I don't want to create a landscape that doesn't look like everything else around me and doesn't um, blend in harmony with the natural ecosystem. If you want to learn about the ecosystems that you might be um, in or all over the landscape of South Carolina, Dr. Porsche's book, um, A Guide to South Carolina Wildflowers, has an incredible introduction that explains the various ecosystems all across South Carolina. So I would welcome you to do that. Another thing that the big picture gives you is a perspective on how well your current gardening plan matches the natural vista. This is just a random address that I picked off the GIS system yesterday. And I want you to look at the left house and the right house, the house on the bottom and the house on the top. Believe it or not, that is the exact same footprint, the exact same architecture. 
And yet look how different the lower picture is from the upper picture. The upper picture is a house and a garden that is part and parcel in harmony with the overall system. The house below that is the, a center of its own universe where it is creating and an artificial environment around it for its own benefit, but not necessarily for the benefit of the overall ecosystem. So seeing the big picture is essential. Secondly, we want to do no harm. Now, this is the organic gardening mantra. This is the certified mantra. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't ever pick up the spray can or you shouldn't ever squash a bug. But if you first agree that you will try everything in your power to seek harmony before you spray, that will give you a much more glorious and easier pathway in your Garden for Life experience. The third rule is collaborate, don't control. When I was showing you that picture of the blue jay on the fence, I, I, that's a blue jay that I picked in my own yard and I saw that it had sticks in its mouth. Obviously it was nesting. Well, if I want to co-create a happy, harmonious garden for myself as well as that blue jay or that butterfly, or that ant, or whatever it is that happens to also call our garden home, I have to change the way I approach my entire system of gardening. Now I want to garden with the benefit of not just myself, but all of those other creatures in mind. So I am agreeing to work with nature to provide her the things that um, are naturally in balance with one another. There's a great story about a man who goes to an organic gardener and says, I have a slug problem. And he says, no, you don't. You have a duck deficit. And what he means is your garden is out of balance. So sure, our gardens can get out of balance and we need to bring them in with perhaps unnatural means. But if we seek first to see where the imbalance might be, we can exponentially solve the problem in a more harmonious way. Observe, observe, observe. Every day I go out into my garden and I just look and I watch and I smell and I listen and I notice. And every day I purposefully seek something that will teach me something. That's a key to gardening for life because you're not just going out to your garden to dominate it and do a whole bunch of chores that make you resent it. You're actually going out into your garden so that the garden can enrich your soul and your mind and your heart as much as you give to the garden. This is an example of a fritillary egg and there are two eggs on the plant. You'll see the one egg, which is very big at the top, but if you look towards the very tiny curl, you'll see another tiny white egg. So the larger egg is about to hatch and the tiny egg was just laid. These are the magical things that happen when you teach yourself how to observe. One key to creating a garden for life garden is to maximize the density of your plantings. So often I see gardeners and they go to the big box store and they get the plant that happens to be in great bloom there and they come home and they plunk it in the ground and then they surround it with a truckload full of mulch. And then about 10 feet later, further away is another one of those and then another one. It is much better 
for you and for the plants themselves if they are interconnected. Not only are we seeking a, an enrichment, a, an interconnection of our spirit with the garden, but we should also allow the garden to seek an interconnection of itself. There are scientific reasons behind this, and that is that most plants and pollinators and herbivores like to be, um, coexist densely with themselves. If left to their own devices, every garden wants to be a forest or a prairie or a marshland or whatever the natural ecosystem is in your area. And the best way that you can assist in that is to reduce your mulch, reduce your monoculture lawn, and maximize the density of your plantings. So if nothing else, you can tell your spouse that it gives you an excuse to buy more plants mm -hmm. and shrink the lawn. Doug Ptolemy has talked to us about this for years and years. Shrinking the lawn um, creates an opportunity for us to still keep the functional areas that are necessary for a safe and happy human life. But if we expand the garden, and you can see in this picture, from USA Today, this gardener's lawn is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. This is a Garden for Life gardener who made the commitment to Doug Ptolemy to start to expand the space slowly over time. And over time, you see that the garden is getting closer and closer and closer to the, to the house. Minimizing the non-functional areas is probably one of the best things that we have learned how to do in corporate America, in industrial landscaping, in cityscaping, and in naturescaping. So on the left is a concrete model. It's safe, it's easy to, to traverse, but it is also sterile. How much more inviting and alive and engaging and environmentally responsible is the habitat on the left, where all they did was carve out a functional pathway through the natural vista. This is our current mantra. It is our mantra that will stay our mantra for a very long time. And that is, we want to plant natives and non-invasives over cultivated, invasive, or big box store um, super bloomers. Now, I'm not saying that you should never buy from a big box store again, because they are starting to catch on by our shifting demand that native plants lead to natural harmony, lead to more enriched ecosystems, et cetera, et cetera. And so the more natives we plant, the more pollinators and herbivores and animals um, can coexist with us and the better we are as human beings and as a planet. So I'm not gonna harp too much on this, but I do want you to remember that this is a key ingredient. When you approach your landscape, I want to make sure that you remember to always landscape in layers. Now, when you take the Master Gardener course, which is an excellent course, or you take the Garden Club Garden Study course, another excellent course, the first thing you learn about is the soil. And so a lot of times as gardeners, we start with the small things. We start with the immediate annuals that give us that immediate gratification. In a garden for life gardening, you are not just gardening for you. You're gardening for everything, every living thing that you want to invite into that space. So it's almost better to go a top down and to start with the canopy layer. Now, most of us already have, when we purchase our properties, we already have a canopy layer, unless you're in a new subdivision, and then you have to start from scratch. 
But the canopy layer is usually in South Carolina, our keystone species, the oak or the pine or the hickory or the other hardwoods that call so many species home. So make sure that you provide as much opportunity for the larger species. These are the species that can grow 75, 100, 120 feet tall. And make sure that you set your landscape plan with that full scale opportunity so that you give that plant and tree room to grow. Once you have your canopy layer, then you go top down. Next, you go to your understory and your edible crops and your shrub layers. And this is where you have your thickets and your hedgerows and your people-free zones. Then you go to the herbaceous layer, your perennials, your annuals, your woody smaller shrubs, your vegetable layer, your blueberry bushes. From there, you go to your pollinator herbaceous layer. And this is where we talk a lot this year, particularly in our planting with a purpose, where we give you the top 16 plants for pollinators and herbivores in your yard. And if you want more information on that, you can go to our website. And then you have your ground covers, your food crops, your root crops. Now these don't always have to be edibles for you. It could be burdock root. It could be horseradish. It could be rhubarb. It could be anything that's going to plow down into the soil and enrich that soil deeper and deeper and deeper. And then once you have all of that, then you add your vines. And these fill in the spaces that are usually connected to your people zones, your house, your fence, the arbor, the trellis, and you let those enhance the vertical nature of your gardening um, landscape plan. Now, most people, when I say people-free zones, they get scared. But if I went into any garden, chances are I would find and identify at least one or two people-free zones. These are absolutely critical to wildlife and natural balance. People-free zones are spaces that are either wild brush piles, um, that area next to your compost pile where you put um, the yard debris. Don't always let it get scooped up and taken to the landfill. I try to strive for an opportunity where nothing leaves our space, where it, it, can, it continually recycles itself and re-nourishes the soil for many reasons. Number one, I want to capture that carbon, but also I want to create habitats for everything that needs to call those people-free zones home. Most of our butterflies, moths, bees, native bees, are desperate for habitats and wild piles, um, sticks, snag trees, dead branches, leaves, and leaf mulch are critical habitats for wilderness. So make sure that you create two types of people-free zones in your garden. One is the wild brush pile, and the second is dense plantings that are so thick and you could put these at the edges of your garden, that you can't naturally walk through them except maybe once or twice a year. These provide critical habitats for mammals and scavengers. Now I know sometimes people get scared of these, but when you clear them out once a year and you let them start over, it gives you exponential more wilderness and wild habitat than you would have 
and you will be amazed at the amount of harmony and surprises that you get from nature just by creating these people-free zones. So this is the enchantment opportunity. This is um, a picture of our garden in Charleston, and you'll see that it is not your typical landscape. You can't look through this entire thing and know and identify every single thing that you're gonna, that's in this space. You can't possibly, but you might want to creep around and get surprised. And this is how you create enchantment opportunities, by maximizing density, by interspersing plant communities, and by layering very thickly so that the only spaces that are open are the utilitarian spaces, the spaces where you will walk, play, cook, grow your food, and entertain. And when you share these spaces with nature, nature will continue to thank you by giving back to you. This is an old chestnut board that I reclaimed from a homestead. And what you'll notice on there is when I brought the wood home, it was filled with the most docile bees on the planet that have gotten the worst rap and that is the carpenter bee. So instead of cursing this bee, I gave it its own home. And so you'll see on, they'll see the holes. And over the years, when the bees abandoned this habitat, the funnel spiders moved in. So again, one habitat leads to another. And the enchantment that I'm talking about is an example right here. This is a solitary bee that fell asleep in a ruella. Now, I would not notice this if I didn't agree to give myself the opportunity to walk around the yard at least twice a day and observe and let nature surprise me. One way that you can do this is by taking your smartphone and challenge yourself as Sue and Jenks and Andy and so many of us do to walk around the space and just try to find how many different types of wildlife you can capture in one stroll. Running water is an incredible um, adapter to a Garden for Life garden. It's an enhancer. When you have running water, you increase your opportunity for wildlife exponentially. Why? Because most wildlife listens for water. They don't look for water. So if they hear that gentle run, it doesn't have to be a giant stream or a giant pond like this one. It can be as simple as a bubbler, a drip fountain, or a sprinkler or a mister that you have in your garden that attracts the wildlife. And then make sure through your density that you give the wildlife plenty of opportunity to seek its own safety. So remember, the goal is to aim for a peaceable kingdom, a garden where everything is welcome and everything is in harmony. And to cultivate an enchantment experience where you lose track of time and where your goal in gardening is to spend more time it's experiencing nature than trying to control it for your own satisfaction. So that in a nutshell is the gardening for life philosophy. I'm glad that you were able to join me today. We have a lot more things that I can talk to you about, but in the interest of time, what I'm going to ask you to do is make sure that if you want to seek other information, here are some of the best books that you can, oh, I lost it, hang on. Here are some of the best books that you wanna copy down. These are all on your worksheet. 
And these will give you a step-by-step shift in paradigm so that when you are seeking harmony in your garden, you are actually doing it slowly over time where you can, in, oh, there it is, where you can work with nature. Obviously, Doug Ptolemy is great. A Guide to Wildflowers is also excellent if you want to learn about South Carolina. But I would invite you to do a few other, add a few other books to your wheelhouse. Food Not Lawns is a great opportunity to help explain why shrinking the lawn and adding more food for you and wildlife is necessary for a healthier environment. The Garden Awakening is by Mary Reynolds, the youngest female to ever win the Chelsea Flower Show Landscape Design Award. And I would also ask you to take part in the Xerces Society, X-E-R-C-E-S. They have a whole line of books that introduces you to working with nature through beneficial insects and pollinators and other invertebrates. 100 Plants to Feed the Bees is a national book that the Xerxes Society puts out and it gives you amazing opportunities and suggestions. Our Planting with a Purpose also, again, gives you the top 16 plants that we have tested across South Carolina at Riverbanks Botanical Garden and found to be a perfect model for enhancing your bee and butterfly landscape. So that is gardening for life. Remember the key to gardening for life is connection, not perfection. I'm Trish Bender, your Garden Club President, and I thank you very much for joining me in this lesson. We will now open it up for questions. Hang on with me just a moment. 